Let's do a rundown of the characters featured in the first episode of City on Fire. There's Charlie, whose father died during the 9-11 attacks, and he goes to New York City for therapy. He's in love with an NYU freshman and his former senior at his school, Samantha. Samantha is following a niche band called Ex Post Facto, made of Sewer, Nikki, Soul, and DT, William used to be a part of the band, but he left after their first album became a hit. William is in a relationship with Mercer. Also, William is Reagan's sister and a member of one of the wealthiest families in the city. Reagan is married to Keith and has two children, Will and Kate. And Keith is having an affair with Samantha. So, you know, full circle and whatnot. William and Reagan are not on speaking terms, and Mercer tries to bridge this gap by getting in touch with Reagan because Kate studies at the school where Mercer teaches. An anonymous letter confirms Reagan's suspicions about Keith's infidelity, which he blames on Reagan and her inability to satiate him. Almost immediately, Reagan decides to break off the marriage. She goes back to Kate's school to meet Mercer and tells her to relay her invitation to the 4th of July party to William. Reagan assumes that Mercer is on good terms with William, but William's heroin addiction doesn't allow him to achieve stability when it comes to his relationships or his artwork. After a time jump of two weeks, we see Soul and Sewer stealing from Sam's father's pyrotechnics shop for their anarchist nonsense. Keith attempts to get back with Reagan, but she shuts those prospects down and orders him to attend her family's 4th of July party. Soul and Sewer come across a drugged out William and invite him to ex Nihilo's performance. Sam contacts Keith to let him know that she's not the one who informed his wife about their relationship and that she wants to meet him. This is followed by some annoying conversations between Sam and Charlie and between Will and Mercer. Sam drops Charlie off at the concert and goes to meet Keith. Reagan attends her family party, where we learn that her father is on the way to New York, but his private plane has been grounded due to a storm. We get to know that Reagan's uncle is Amory and his partner is Felicia, and both of them are incredibly frustrating. Keith arrives at the Hamilton Sweeney party, but as soon as he notices Sam standing across the building, he asks the driver to keep driving because he doesn't want her to follow him into the party and create a scene. Mercer coincidentally meets Sam, and they have an incredibly awkward conversation. The writers and the director want to make it seem like a spontaneous moment. However, everything about it is so contrived and an obvious setup for how their paths are going to collide that it's maddening to watch. Anyway, Mercer attends Reagan's party. Charlie sniffs some heroin with Nikki and William. Reagan learns that the FBI is going to arrest her dad for committing fraud. So she exits the party. Mercer leaves too. While waiting for the bus, he notices that Sam has been shot in the head because she heard some ominous sounds and ventures into the park behind the bus stop. Charlie arrives at the scene of the crime almost randomly and wets his pants upon seeing Sam's lifeless body. Hence, he discards his pants and makes a run for it. The episode ends with the insinuation that Keith Orwell has shot Sam. But Mercer is the one who is arrested by detectives PJ McFadden and Ollie Parsa because the jacket that Mercer used to cover Sam's body had a packet of heroin in it. Technically, the jacket belongs to William and, therefore, the drugs. The second episode of City on Fire starts with a flashback of Charlie and Sam going for a night of revelry on New Year's Eve 2002 after consuming a bunch of mushrooms. Sam overdoses. So, Charlie takes her to ex post factos or ex nihilo's basement so that Sam can chill out. Soul advises Charlie to give Sam a cold shower so that she doesn't feel as intoxicated. Charlie sees Sam semi-naked and immediately confesses his love to her. It seems like Sam is unconscious. But, in order to not make it seem that Charlie has sexually harassed a senseless girl, the episode shows that Sam isn't asleep, and she hears Charlie's confession. However, that only means she has been aware of his feelings for her all this time and has tagged him along. Yes, I know that every friendship that exists between a man and a woman doesn't have to lead to something sexual or romantic. That said, if one party wants to keep things platonic, they should explicitly state it instead of enjoying the other party's puppy dog behavior. It's as simple as that. By the way, while all this is going on, Nikki gives one of the most pretentious and hackneyed end-of-year motivation speeches I've ever heard. In the present day, it is revealed that Sam isn't exactly dead. She has a bullet lodged in her brain, but she's still alive. We see Keith, Will, and Reagan returning home. A pantless Charlie goes to the church to pray. I do want to point out that this is such a weird character decision. Why did he run from the scene? Why did he wet his pants? I understand the part where he discarded it. But why run? 
Is it linked to the trauma of his father's death? But all of this doesn't make any sense because it is an attempted murder, and that was a terrorist attack. It's not even confusing at this point, it's stupid. Through a conversation between Mercer and Detective Ollie, the episode restates the obvious regarding Mercer's innocence. Mercer is allowed to walk and isn't jailed for possessing drugs while being around a crime scene. Charlie tells the priest at the church where he slept all night that he wants Sam to survive. Reagan tries to talk to her father, but she isn't allowed to do so. So she calls her husband because he's the only one he can talk to. Mercer explains what went down at the Hamilton Sweeney 4th of July party and how he was almost locked up for good because of William's heroin addiction. But William pushes Mercer away, literally and metaphorically, while Mercer is reciting a version of the witch incantation from The Craft. William does apologize, though, and Mercer apparently forgives him too. Before handing over the kids to Keith so that she can go and meet her father, Reagan notices that the bird that was outside her bedroom window has been shot. We finally see Charlie's mother, and Charlie obviously doesn't tell her anything about the shooting. Instead, he heads over to the headquarters of the ex Nihilo. The detectives go to Sam's NYU dorm to talk to her roommate and look for any hints pointing toward the identity of the shooter. They get nothing from her, but I think the show wants you to think that she can be the shooter too because she jokes about how Sam never called her to her parties. Amory learns that Keith never showed up at the party. Bill Sr. gets arrested by the FBI as soon as he lands in New York City. While Reagan is angry about it, Felicia and Amory are awfully casual about it. When Charlie arrives at the ex Nilo HQ, they find them making a bomb. Assuming that he's some kind of a snitch, Sol knocks Charlie out. During the investigation of the crime scene, Ollie comes across Charlie's pants, his ID card, and an ex Nilo flyer, thereby putting him and the band on the radar. The third episode of City on Fire starts with a rundown of how Sam became a fan of the band in question. Ollie questions the bouncer about Charlie and asks him to come to the station for a facial composite. Charlie regains consciousness and meets the members of Ex Nihilo, and the episode proceeds to recap everything that has happened till this point. William and Mercer's insufferable arcs as they meet William's gallerist, Bruno, and Bruno's assistant or colleague, Jenny, at a restaurant. They go on and on about William and his talent and whatnot before heading to William's workstation, where they see his subpar work on display and come to the conclusion that his brain is being fogged by his drug usage. After Bruno and Jenny leave, William and Mercer almost have yet another argument, and it seems like William wants to end their relationship. Nikki and Charlie have a conversation about forgiveness, and it's as surface level as you can imagine. Reagan learns that Bill Sr. has retired from his position at the family company, so the FBI can't prosecute for the crimes that have been committed in his name or by him. Reagan has no option but to accept this course of action because of how forcefully Amory and Felicia are implementing it. On her way out of the building, she comes across Mercer, who wants to conduct an intervention to stop William from having drugs and push him towards therapy, and he wants Reagan to be a part of this meeting. Joe Young Sam's father helps Ollie go through Sam's stuff and Ollie leaves with the zines ex post facto. Sewer assigns some tasks to Charlie to prove the point that the band is a cover for their anarchist work. Anarchy against what? We'll come to that in a bit. Ollie finally realizes that Charlie is the guy that the bouncer is talking about, and he puts out an arrest order for him because he's a suspect. Reagan and Keith seem to be together. Yes, they pretend that they're going to continue with the divorce, but Reagan is so dependent on Keith that she just can't let go of him. Keith clearly enjoys this, as he stays back to look after the kids while Reagan goes for the intervention, which goes as badly as you'd expect it to go. Then we see flashbacks of Keith going to the ex Nihilo headquarters to deposit envelopes of money while having a revolver on his waist. Apparently, that led to his meeting with Sam, they fell in love, and they had an affair. In the present day, Keith revisits Sam's dorm only to come across her panda-loving roommate, and he weirdly expresses shock upon learning that Sam is a freshman. Are we supposed to assume that he didn't know he was fooling around with someone who had just graduated from high school? At the end of episode 3 of City on Fire, we see that Amory has made himself the interim CEO of the Hamilton Sweeney Company, which means that this was his plan all along. Reagan obviously understands that, but she can't do anything about it. The members of the ex Nilo and Charlie have a rooftop conversation about monogamy being a way to promote patriarchy, thereby justifying cheating on one's partner, and then a vague oath about doing something for Samantha. Without understanding what this oath means, Charlie says that he is all in and is ready to do whatever the ex Nihilo wants him to do. 
What do they want him to do? Set fire to an abandoned building. Why? Apparently, these doofuses think that the city is being taken over by someone and that the only way to fight back is by setting abandoned buildings on fire. Since Charlie is an idiot, he commits arson. During the final moments of the episode, Keith and Amory meet up to talk about the attack on Sam, and it seems like Amory insinuates that Sam is in this situation because of Keith. Again, the show probably wants us to think that Amory is yet another suspect. However, the truth is that Amory is just highlighting Keith's guilty behavior and warning him that if he keeps doing shady stuff, the police are eventually going to connect him to Sam and send him to jail. There's a good chance that that'll happen because, after Keith's visit to the NYU dorm, we saw Sam's roommate calling the police. Therefore, it's only a matter of time before Ollie and McFadden get to Keith. Thank you for joining us on this journey. And I hope you enjoyed the episodes of City on Fire.